Hello again, Eco736 students. Welcome to week two of Development Economics. I trust that your first week eased you into what we expect from you this semester, that you've caught up with Ecamva and how the platform works, and that you are already starting to work on your weekly reading assignment, which is due before your lecture this Thursday, before 9.25. So, welcome to week two. This week we look at development perspectives. We ease you into development economics and also give you an opportunity to go back over your undergraduate work and some theories you may have forgotten about. So, just a friendly reminder, let's uh, look through the agenda for week two. You know that this week you are submitting your weekly reading assignment one. Um, there's also someone who will be submitting their presentation as well. What you need to do um, is also review the lecture slides and video clips for this week. And remember that on Thursday during the lecture period, um, you can also use that time to chat with your peers and myself about this week's content and about anything else that you'd like to ask questions on. So what exactly is economic development? Okay, many of you may be wondering how is this different from economic growth, which you've learned a lot about in macroeconomics. Well, when we talk about economic development, we are referring to a process of structural change, which ensures a sustained rise in living standards of the whole population i.e. the growth that happens is happening constantly, it's sustained, and it's inclusive. It takes everyone with that growth. Everyone benefits from it. Structural change and discontinuities, depending on which country you look at, is the emphasis rather than economic growth alone. So in macroeconomics, you were looking purely at economic growth, but we are actually looking at the underlying mechanisms, those structural elements and how they are changing in an economy. That is what we emphasize in economic development. Furthermore, because growth has to be inclusive, we are very interested uh, in development economics about how the gains from economic growth is distributed. So we care about the distribution of the gains. And that is why inequality will come up a lot throughout this course. Okay, so let's start off with something you're familiar with. You are all used to describing an economy with an aggregate production function, right? So your aggregate production is basically a function of capital and human capital. So what justifies that production function is a specific assumption. And the assumption is that each factor, in this specific case capital and human capital, gets allocated to its most productive use. In other words, the marginal return of every investment is equalized. Now, this assumption is reasonable if we operate in a, in a context where market forces prevail. Okay? And in this case, it doesn't matter where exactly capital or human capital is invested. Example, sorry, in other words, you can think of basically only one aggregate stock. And this, if it looks familiar, this is taken from the solo model. But what do we know about the assumptions that we've been taught at an undergraduate level? In reality, in the real world, a lot of these assumptions don't always hold. In other words, is it true that your returns to capital, with its normal capital or human capital, can be equalized within all economies? And the straightforward answer to that is no. This assumption does not always prevail. In fact, returns to capital and human capital can vary significantly within a, in a particular country, even more so than between different countries. And this leads us to a central question in development economics. Why do some economies develop 
and others not. More specifically, we look at some of the barriers that prevent the returns to capital being equalized within a developing country. These are the barriers that we will be reviewing for the rest of the semester under different subheadings. So let's look at a few development perspectives. We'll refresh your memory again um, on the neoclassical growth model, or the solo model as you used to it being called. Well, according to that model, it predicts that productivity will eventually converge between rich and poor nations, okay? But when you look at the empirical evidence, this only appears to occur within a so-called convergence club. The convergence club basically referring to the possibility that absolute convergence may be restricted to a specific set of economies. So this convergence between rich and poor nations don't necessarily apply to those who are outside the convergence club. Apparently, there are other countries, example countries in Africa, that are hampered by a lack of what they refer to as social capability. So, if you look at the definition of social capital, it is networks together with shared norms, values and understandings that facilitate cooperation within or among groups. That's the OECD's definition of social capital. And basically, um, with the, with the neoclassical growth model, they are saying that, well, some countries, some poor countries are not going to converge, um, with rich countries because they lack social, the social capital. They lack the social capabilities. So, coming with that type of perspective, some economists may view development as a task of certain institutions, for example, like government, and leads to phrasing that you'll often hear about when they write or when they speak, phrases such as developing a community or development manager. So it's very much, um, we will do this to you type of approach. You can compare this to other economists who rather look at development as a social process and this is this is how i'd like you to think about development in this module okay it's a social process that needs to be studied and understood and it's not only for its policy impl implications so that we can fix it from the outside even though we do tend to talk this way it is a rather arrogant approach and we should be very careful and censor ourselves when we start talking like this okay so what i'm trying to say is that how i would like you to view development economics is that when you're referring to issues you should rather ask yourself how does a poor country develop and not how do you develop a poor country as if it's an external force that is going to fix this poor country okay we should try as economists not to take this condescending paternalistic approach um, this is my personal view and one that i'd like to share with you um, but in our discussion forum in our chat groups on thursday we can we can talk about how you view it as well. Um, I'm not dogmatic in, in how I expect you to internalize what the information that is shared with you throughout this course. Um, but if I've got an opportunity to try and influence you in a, in a positive way, or what I think is a positive way, I will do so. Okay, so this slide basically is going to be demonstrating to you what the effect of, of economic growth can be on an economy over a period of time. But this is specifically sustained growth. So if we look at um, these columns going across here, um, they are in chunks of decades, so up to 60 years. And over here on our vertical axis, 
axis, um, we've got a percentage, annual percentage growth, okay? So if this can be some random country and they start off with a hypothetical baseline of one, okay? If that economy grows consistently at 1% per growth annually, okay, over a period of 60 years, you can see that by 60 years, they would have almost, that economy would have almost doubled in size, okay? So that would be enough. 60 years is about one generation that's one life sp lifespan of a person and if you can imagine consistently growing at one percent um, per annum over that period there is an opportunity for someone or a family who is living in poverty potentially if they have benefited if the gains over year of this growth was distributed equally that poor family could potentially escape that poverty trap within the next generation at a sustained annual growth of 1%. Okay. And you can see that if we increase this, you can see 2%. It's almost threefold. Okay. After 60 years, look at 8% sustained growth from one, a baseline of one to 101.3. Okay. So, this shows you the importance of ensuring that growth is sustained. When we move forward, as an economy grows, we need to ensure that it continues on that trajectory and not go backwards. And if this is happening constantly, there is potential for a family to escape poverty within one generation. Okay? Ceteris paribus, because an aspect that we cannot see over here, and which I alluded to earlier, is the fact that the distribution of these gains need to be equal. But let's move beyond money metric measures, okay? Since we've already said that development economics goes beyond just looking at economic growth. Let's look at other structural issues, perhaps pertaining to health indicators. So if you look at this table here with three countries and two indicators per capita income as well as life expectancy, which country do you think is developed? Okay, so maybe you think this is a trick question, maybe not. Go back to how we define economic development. We don't care simply about the money metric measures okay so if i only cared about per capita income i would say wow um but this country b equatorial guinea they are very developed look the per capita income is 13340 but look at other issues look at their life expectancy it's 53 which is really low okay i would opt and say you know what I think country C Malaysia is the most developed because they've got a fairly high per capita income but they also have the highest life expectancy I wouldn't choose Sri Lanka because as great as their life expectancy is you can see that the per capita income is very low so I would expect that there's a high degree of poverty in that country and so basically when you're looking at countries and you want to see whether it's developed or not as you know from your undergraduate work you are going to move away from just these standard macro indicators that you are used to you're going to start looking at health indicators education indicators literacy numeracy levels within a country you're going to look at agricultural development issues of migration and labor social protection employment unemployment all of those factors come into development economics. I'm slowly running out of time here with my screen omatic, so let me wrap up here and begin the next video clip.